Hello, how are you today? I hope you are well and you are ready to listen to another audio book about Warhammer 40,000 lore. This time let's listen about chaos. Without further ado let's get to the first part of the article. Every moment of anger, hate, deceit, pain, suffering, pleasure and desire is mirrored in the power of chaos. When its legions march, they march to return upon us a ruin that is of our own making. Arenal, Eldar Farseer. Chaos, also known to its servants as the Primordial Truth or the Primordial Annihilator, and to the Imperium of Man as the Archenemy, is the universal and usually malign spiritual force embodied by the malevolent intelligent entities comprised of psychic energy that live in the warp. Chaos is equal and opposite of order. The entities who embody chaos are mostly demons, but the term also encompasses those mortals who have thrown in their lot with chaos, ranging from simple peasants or manufacturum laborers who serve as chaos cultists, to traitor imperial guardsmen, planetary militia, imperial nobles, planetary governors, and even the mighty chaos space marines and traitor titan legions of the Dark Mechanicus. Chaos is also itself the turbulent psychic energy that comprises the immaterium and gives shape to the nightmare domains of the individual chaos gods that are collectively called the realm of chaos by servants of the Inquisition. Chaos is almost synonymous with the warp, the two concepts are inseparable, for chaos is the limitless ocean of spiritual, psychic and emotional energy that defines the immaterium and underlies the four-dimensional material universe of space-time. It is a great and raw force of change and power, and is both physically and spiritually corrupting, though it is not in itself necessarily evil. While its adherents and servants act in ways that are often malevolent, some devotees of chaos are more dedicated to the service of freedom and change than of the pure selfishness that mankind and most other intelligent species define as nefarious. However, more often than not, the chaos gods reward individual accomplishment in such a way that the ends justify the means, and the absence of hierarchy and emphasis on individual freedom leads to the pursuit of excess and personal aggrandizement that can only be characterized as damnation. The most evolutionarily advanced mortals, psychers, can utilize this energy, thus making them capable of abilities which transcend the standard physical laws of the material universe as humanity understands them. However, the malevolent power of chaos can gradually corrupt a psyker, tainting his mind and body and turning him into the slave of the ruinous powers. The most powerful entities of chaos are the four great chaos gods, also known as the ruinous powers, who each embody one aspect of the greater force of chaos and can be worshipped individually or as an entire pantheon. The iconic symbol of chaos is the eight-pointed star, representing the infinite possibilities of chaos. Ultimately chaos and its entities seek nothing less than the complete destruction of the material universe and its hated order, so that all of creation is once more consumed by the primordial and uncontained energies of chaos. In general, chaos is a malevolent spiritual force that represents the collective negative aspects of the psyches of every sentient being in the Milky Way galaxy, and most likely in the wider universe. Because mankind is by far the most populous intelligent species in the galaxy of the late 41st millennium, the Chaos Gods particularly embody humanity's myriad and particular flaws as a people. Chaos corrupts mankind so easily because it speaks to the character flaws inherent in every man and woman and seeks to exploit the weaknesses of their all too human natures. It takes an extraordinary individual of truly iron will and selflessness to resist the serial temptations of chaos. It is also these inherent character flaws that produce the rampant physical and anatomical mutations of individuals exposed to chaotic energies. As these mutations are driven by the inner flaws of the person's psyche being made manifest in the physical person as chaos bridges the gap between the immaterium and real space. 
with all the obvious dangers associated with chaos, such as mutation, demonic possession, and spiritual damnation, some might wonder why anyone would willingly choose to serve the ruinous powers. The answer is actually simple. Chaos judges its servants solely on their abilities and their records of success and failure in promoting the agenda of the individual chaos gods and of chaos undivided as a whole. Chaos also offers those who serve it the opportunity to perhaps one day wield power and respect far beyond the dreams of most mortals' avarice. For so many people, but particularly in the oppressive, feudal imperium of man, where too often family connections and inherited wealth are awarded rather than ability, and where it is impossible on many worlds for a talented individual to ever better their lot. Chaos actually offers a substantial degree of freedom and the only real meritocracy that they have ever known. But chaos is not a benevolent force, and for the vast majority of those who fall to chaos temptations, they will never reach either power or position and will be little more than faceless puppets in the endless schemes of the dark gods. While chaos may reward success with power, even the mightiest chaos servant becomes a slave of chaos, never its master. Most chaotics will fail in their quests for power, eventually ending up as possessed demon hosts, mindless chaos spawn, or simply as just another corpse in the heap, a pawn whose usefulness to the ruinous powers has ended. History You are not free whose liberty is won by the rigor of other, more righteous souls. You are merely protected. Your freedom is parasitic, you take and offer nothing in return. You who have enjoyed freedom, who have done nothing to earn it, your time has come. The Inquisitor Bronislav Chevak's address to the Council of Ryanty. At the dawn of time, the powerful and ancient alien race known only as the Old Ones look after some of the primitive intelligent races of the Milky Way galaxy, guiding the development to suit a specific purpose. The warp at this time in the neighborhood of the galaxy was not the intrinsically hostile place to live it has become in later ages. Once the Necrons arose to challenge them and nearly brought their extinction because of their alliance with the hostile star gods known as the Cetin, the Old Ones created new psychic warrior races to battle the threat they posed. Hoping that these species stronger ties to the warp and potent psychic powers would turn the tide against the Necrons and the Cetan masters in the ancient war in heaven. One of these races was the ancestors of the Eldar and among the others were the Krog, who may have been the ancestors of the green-skinned orcs. Just before the birth of the Emperor of Mankind on Terra in the 8th millennium BC, three of the major chaos gods of the present, Kornch, Sinj, and Nurgle, had already begun to take form in the warp. Although it would take until the end of Terra's European Middle Ages midway through the 2nd millennium, circa 1400 AD, for them to fully awaken. Slanesh did not awaken until the 30th millennium, brought into existence by the terrible collective psychic flaws of the ancient Eldar, with its birth to consciousness in the warp marking the end of the Eldar's great interstellar empire and the Age of Strife, as well as the beginning of the Emperor's Great Crusade and the birth of the Imperium of Man. In truth, the time has no meaning within the Immaterium, and from the point of view of the Dark Gods, all four of them are relative newborns, while, at the same time, they have existed since the first mortal woke to sentience in the galaxy tens of millions of Terran years ago. The rise of Chaos and the first three Chaos Gods seems to correspond to the rapid rise and development of humanity in the Milky Way galaxy, insinuate that mankind, of all the sentient species of the galaxy, was primarily responsible for the disharmonizing of the warp and the birth of the first three Chaos Gods, or at least the major Chaos Gods in the current form. Although without question, all the sentient species of the Milky Way played a role in the birth of the Chaos Gods, it seems that mankind has an especially close relationship with Chaos, or that the nature of mankind's collective psyche is particularly aggressive, unstable and yes, chaotic. Age of the Imperium
Over 100 centuries ago the all-powerful emperor of mankind was hidden in a huge stasis crypt called the Golden Throne inside of the Imperial Palace on ancient terror. He has not moved or spoken in thousands of years, but his legacy lives on in the vast imperium he helped to forge through an era of violence and conquest. In that time, the Imperium has slowly crumbled, battered by wars from without and dissension from within, but it remains unbelievably powerful. A million worlds united in the name of mankind, monotheistic, xenophobic, paranoic, and fueled by war. With its vast fleets and uncounted armies, the Imperium remains probably the single most powerful entity in the galaxy of the late 41st millennium. The adepts of the Adeptus Terra, the priesthood of Earth, cling to power ferociously, ruling on in the name of the corpse on the Golden Throne despite the Empress' millennia-long silence. They hold the worlds of the Imperium in a constant state of terror, spread the fanatism and feeding the fears of the populace to keep them intimidate and susceptible. An Imperial citizen is raised from birth to believe that unseen forces are gathering to attack them and that their way of life could be destroyed at any moment, and that only the God Emperor stands between them and damnation. Under the guise of protection whole populations are held hostage to authoritarian controls, such as confiscations and summary executions are routinely justified under the banner of omnipresent threat. The Imperium thrives on war and oppression. Its weapon factories and shipyards run night and day, arming its forces, and faceless conscripts by the billion are hurled into conflicts they cannot win. Imperial citizens are indoctrinated from birth to hate and fear outsiders, and at any given time the Imperium is fighting dozens of genocidal conflicts. This perpetual state of war and fear has served the Imperium well over its many centuries of existence, reinforcing its self-righteous declaration of itself as a defender of humanity while driving a wedge between itself and the other star-faring races. The Imperium's ponderous, gargantuan military grinds relentlessly forward seeking new wars to embroil itself in, driven by its own momentum and blind arrogance. Some joke that an outbreak of peace would be the greatest disaster that could ever befall the Imperium, but in truth, the Adepts of Terra are quite able to find enemies in their own ranks. Planets groaning too loudly beneath Imperial tithes are quickly branded as traitors, or heretics, and just as quickly feel the iron heel of the Imperial military on their necks. On loyalist imperial worlds which hunts are actively promoted by the authorities, in particular mutants and psychers are mercilessly singled out and hunted down. Mutants are killed out of hand on many planets amidst calls for genetic purity, but in places where they are too numerous and too vital to the economy wipe out they are pushed into an underclass despised and feared by normals. Psychers have the crueler fate by far. The Imperium lays claim to any individual showing the slightest psychic ability. Periodically, often decades apart, the ominous black ships and the agents of the dreaded Inquisition come to each Imperial world to demand its crop of psychers for processing on distant terror. The slightest flicker of potential is enough for the Inquisitors, and their holds are filled with thousands, young and old. All but the tiniest fraction of those who enter the black ships are never heard from again. Legends abound of their eventual fate, some say that the souls are fed to the Emperor and that a thousand are sacrificed every day just to keep his guttering life spark vital. Others say the psychos are blinded and castrated in both the bodies and powers, and that once diminished they are joined to a great choir that endlessly chants mindless praises to the God Emperor into the uncaring void. Whatever the fate of the psyches may be, the coming of the black ships is a great terror for any world, and their appearance frequently triggers rioting and rebellions from peoples unwilling to give up their own family members to feed the Imperium's voracious appetite. Such resistance is ruthlessly crushed by whatever means necessary. The Imperium is said to encompass a million worlds but accurate numbers are impossible to gauge.
In the time taken for reports to cross the galaxy conquered worlds are regained and new ones are lost more quickly than administratum scriveners can update the ponderous data stacks. The worlds of the Imperium include every conceivable type, from isolated colonies to thriving hive worlds, from monoculture agri-worlds and vast orbital forges. Wherever man has made a place for himself in the galaxy he stands beneath the shadow of the Imperial Aquila. As has been proven in the past, if the forces of the Imperium could ever be unified and set to a single purpose, there is nothing they could not achieve. Fortunately for the other inhabitants of the galaxy, human endeavor has been thwarted by the unthinkable distances involved in the sprawling empire, internal dissension, and interdepartmental rivalry. Even with the illusion of centralized control given by the Adeptus Terra, parts of the Imperium tens of thousands of light years apart can do little to support one another in practical terms. Instead, rulership often devolves down to loosely aligned subsets of the most influential worlds collaborate to exploit their close neighbors under the disguise of imperial authority. The Imperium has been far more successful in creating a common cultural and philosophical center by dominating science, education, and the arts on worlds from one side of the galaxy to the other. The history and viewpoints of the Imperium change drastically, depending on whom you ask. To some, the Imperium of Man is a fortification against the tides of darkness, a brutal but necessarily defense against forces that would rip humanity apart. To others, it is a harsh, crumbling monolith, lashing out with blind fury against those who want to save mankind and lift them to the true potential. It is an obstacle and one that must be overcome at all costs. Which is correct. Both and neither. All depends on one's point of view. A champion of the Imperium such as a Space Marine Brother Captain or Puritan Inquisitor likely takes the first view, or perhaps holds the Imperium in even higher regard. On the other hand, a champion of the Ruinous Powers, perhaps one of the traitor legions of Chaos Space Marines, almost certainly takes the second view. Needless to say, the following account is penned from the viewpoint of the disciples of the Dark Gods, those who fight against the Imperium of Man, and the forces of order in all the forms. Is it correct? That is for you to decide. Origins of the Imperium Mankind spread across the stars far before the rise of the Imperium. Long ago in a forgotten golden age, innumerable worlds were settled by humans, and dozens of different cultures flourished across the great wheel of the galaxy. Within the Imperium this first great expansion by humanity is now known as the Dark Age of Technology. That age is believed to have begun slowly, as multi-generational colony ships crawled across the void at sublight speeds. However, as mankind discovered the secrets of warp travel their expansion accelerated rapidly. Whole worlds were terraformed by these first waves of colonists, and their handiwork is still apparent thousands of standard years later. Many of the scientific wonders of that age are unparalleled in present times, and most of the greatest creations made by the ancients are reckoned irretrievably lost during the ensuing Age of Strife. Tech scholars and auto-savants of the Adeptus Mechanicus obsessively seek out traces of technology left from the Dark Age of Technology, as its sophistication far exceeds anything built later. Some few artifacts are found from time to time, objects that have endured down the millennia due to the craftsmanship and forethought of their makers. On occasion, a void ship that has lain trapped in the tides of the warp for eons is cast out into the material universe and brings with it a treasure house of Dark Age technology for those bold enough to seize it. Whatever the source might be, the adherents of the cult Mechanicus descend on Dark Age technology like a pack of jackals. Their explorator fleets comb the stars constantly and are always alert for the slightest rumor. One discovery that has been key to the rise of the Imperium is standard template construction technology, the SDC system, as it has become known. 
It appears that the technomancers of the earliest times created a robust automated factory program and database to support their emerging colony worlds, complex systems that could be adapted to local conditions and use a variety of raw materials. Templates have been found for everything from gigantic plasma reactors to steam-driven traction engines that were created to fulfill the needs of the early human interstellar colonists. However, most of the templates from the Dark Age of Technology are lost, and as such, even a single SDC data template is a treasure beyond compare. Each new discovery is dutifully filed and hidden away in the archives of the Adeptus Mechanicus. Knowledge is power in the Imperium, and in many ways, the SDC system embodies the highest knowledge mankind can now achieve. The Dark Age of Technology exists only in myth in modern times, and the causes of its ending are poorly understood. Many cultures share similar stories of a breakdown of the Golden Age, of entire regions becoming isolated by raging warp storms and turning against themselves in crippling wars. Others tell of a time of apotheosis for mankind when mutations and psychic powers became increasingly prevalent, and predatory beings from warp space used such open conduits to feast on the living. Worshippers of the ruinous powers maintain that these times were the triumph of chaos when mankind's first fumbling attempts to rule over the mortal realm were cast down into anarchy by cackling demons from the warp. Whatever the cause, the Dark Age of Technology gave way to the Age of Strife. The patchwork remnants of human civilization fought against each other as well as the hordes of aliens now swarming in to sack their worlds. Many human civilizations were enslaved or completely wiped out, others reverted to barbarism as order crumbled. Only worlds where the rising tide of psychers was rigorously repressed evaded the plummet into nightmare and madness. Old Earth itself became completely isolated by warp storms for several thousand years, collapsing into a state of total anarchy, with savage gangs of tech pirates roving the ruins of its ravaged continents. Followers of the Emperor claimed that he first appeared on Earth during the Age of Strife in the 30th millennium and that his true name and origins were obscure even then. The nameless Emperor fought his way to the top of the techno-barbarian tribes and nation-states, conquering them one after another. The Emperor emerged as a saviour, they say, leading armies across terror in his efforts to reunify it. The ranks of his armies swelled with eager followers and conquered tribes forced to pledge fealty alike. The Emperor united them all with a vision of humanity made whole once more, free from slavery and the chains of barbaric ignorance. He foresaw a day when his followers would leave Earth and strike out across the heavens to cleanse the scattered worlds of humanity of both aliens and demons. Some speculate that the Emperor must have had some precognitive sense of the approaching emergence of Slanesh and the effects of that event on the warp. His psychic acuity is the stuff of legend and undoubtedly it was sensitive enough to sense the coming cataclysm. While Earth remained isolated by warp storms the Emperor was able to ascend to Mars and there he found the tech priests of the cult Mechanicus still enumerating among the rusting machinery of their predecessors. In perhaps his greatest coup before the creation of the Imperium itself the Emperor convinced the tech priests of Mars that he was the living embodiment of the deity, the Omnissiah, and so won their fealty. The Emperor's followers like to portray this joining with the cult Mechanicus as a joyous occasion, the rejoining of two parts of a whole. Despite the propaganda the link was not an entirely comfortable one and, as would be proven later, a large number of the tech priests did not truly accept the Emperor as their living god. Nonetheless, with the tech priests' help the Emperor set about his final preparation for the coming crusade across the stars. Fearing that the power of chaos would eventually corrupt all of humanity at some point in the future, the Emperor set about creating mankind's replacement, the Primarchs. The Primarchs were genetically engineered superhumans with godlike powers, bred for strength and loyalty. 
the Emperor's intention was to create an entire race of superhumans from the genetic template of the first Primarchs. He hoped that his efforts would create a laboratory-bred purity completely immune to the influences of chaos. Followers of the Emperor maintained that the Primarchs were never intended to truly replace mankind, rather that they were to be shining examples of humanity free from the taint of corruption. However, the Chaos Powers perceived the Emperor's schemes and seized the fetal Primarchs before they could reach maturity. Seeing the potential value of the Primarchs the Ruinous Powers did not aim to destroy them, instead scattering them far and wide across the galaxy. The Primarchs developed independently beyond the Emperor's reach, only being rediscovered later as the Great Crusade advanced. Hence the Emperor lost his first battle with Chaos before he even left Earth. The Emperor was unable to recreate the Primarchs in the time left to him, and even now the birth pangs of Slanesh were becoming louder and louder as the Godling came to full wakefulness. Instead, the Emperor evolved a new plan. Using genetic material that had been imprinted from the Primarchs into laboratory golems, he reproduced some of the qualities as discrete biological organs. By implanting these organs into young, growing male human bodies some of the qualities of the Primarchs could be recreated albeit in a lessened form. In this way, the first space marines were created, and soon entire legions of Astartes were created utilizing that grown genetic material from the prime arcs. Loyalists also portray this event as a source of great rejoicing among the Emperor's followers, although the reaction of the veterans that had fought for his cause during the Unification Wars being supplanted in this manner can be imagined to be less than effusive. Nonetheless, the superhuman space marine legions were destined to become the killing edge of the Emperor's forces for the coming crusade and within the Imperium thereafter. When the Prince of Chaos, Slanesh, finally burst forth to full waking his birth scream shook the galaxy in the early 30th millennium. Despite its relative proximity to the newly forming Eye of Terror, Earth escaped much of the ruin visited elsewhere. The churning warp storms surrounding ancient terror absorbed most of the psychic shock wave before being shredded apart by it, leaving the warp space around the cradle of humanity quiescent for the first time in thousands of years. Now was the moment for the reunification of mankind, and the Emperor's shining feet swept outward into the darkness at his command. The Imperium was forged during the centuries that followed in an era of conquest and expansion in the late 30th millennium known as the Great Crusade. Great Crusade. The Emperor first directed his forces in pursuit of his lost Primarchs, no doubt fearing to allow such godlike beings to stray far from his guidance. The Emperor sought after them with his psychic powers and was drawn across time and space to the places where his offspring could be found. In each place they found the Primarchs to be full-grown leaders and warriors within their adoptive culture. The Emperor must have believed his experiment to have been a success for the lost Primarchs proved to have no discernible taint of corruption about him despite the brush with chaos. There are many imperial legends of the Emperor meeting one or other of his Primarchs for the first time during the Great Crusade. Most speak of a mysterious stranger arriving at the Primarch's court and performing one or more impossible deeds, usually including defeating the Primarch himself in combat, before the revealing his true identity as the Emperor the Primarch's gene father. In the legends, the amazed Primarch pledges lifelong allegiance to the Emperor and happily joins his entourage immediately. It's certain that such stories are used to mask the ugly truth that several of the lost Primarchs had to be physically subdued before they would agree to join the Emperor. The Emperor showed great indulgence to his foundlings. As each Primarch was won over they were given command over a legion of space marines raised from their own genetic material. With the Primarch leading them a space marine legion became utterly unstoppable, a fearless army of superhumans that would conquer or perish no matter the odds. 
Some felt that the love the space marines exhibited toward the primogenitors exceeded even their conditioned loyalty to the emperor. With the emperor at its head and the primarchs at his side, the great crusade swept all before it. It is likely that no great armada has ever been seen in the galaxy before or since. The emperor's forces certainly did not lack opposition, and heavy fighting marked the progress. Wherever the silver ships landed the flames of war followed. The emperor's followers found many strange and terrible worlds where humans and aliens coexisted, or chaos reigned triumphantly, these they purged most mercilessly of all. Alien empires were driven back and defeated by the Great Crusade, enslaved populations of captive humans were set free. Psychers and mutants were ruthlessly massacred and the followers of the Chaos Gods forced into hiding. Many aliens learned to hate and fear the Imperium during the Great Crusade, and the rabid xenophobia of those times has been attributed to all humans ever since. In some places, coalitions of human worlds had survived the Age of Strife and many of these attempted to resist the imperialist onslaught from ancient terror. Untold billions were killed by the Space Marine Legions and much precious technology was lost when the Emperor's forces resorted to brute force to overwhelm more advanced worlds. The Crusades' indiscriminate use of virus bombs and cyclonic torpedoes obliterated secrets that had been preserved for millennia. Increasingly the Space Marine Legions began to find themselves deployed against human populations whose only crime was an unwillingness to join the Imperium. The Emperor's message of unification had changed to one of domination, and those that did not submit were branded enemies to be righteously purged. The Great Crusade railed onward relentlessly, sustained now by its own momentum as it swept outward to the very fringes of the galaxy. In the wake of the crusading forces, the future infrastructure of empire moved into place on the conquered worlds, governments and nobility became subject to the administratum, the adeptus arbites replaced judges and lawmakers. Over time even mechanicians and technologists became supplanted by the Adeptus Mechanicus. Planetary governors took control, providing they met the tithes. Decrees from distant terror imposed rigorous conformity on wildly divergent peoples and cultures, establishing a pattern of oppression and drudgery that became the norm for life in the Imperium. Despite the warning signs, the majority of humanity rose to the challenge of rebuilding its ancient heritage in exchange for the promise of a better future. For a time the unity and strength of the Imperium seemed unstoppable, and the powers of chaos appeared to have retreated to their own realms. It was not so. The Horus Heresy. The Primarchs had not escaped the brush with chaos entirely untouched. As the Great Crusade wore on their dreams became disturbed by the insidious whispers of the ruinous powers. Each Primarch's character was severely tested by the unspoken urgings, each of them thinking that they alone bore such flaws. The future promise of power became a temptation for some, in others, their pride or martial prowess opened a path of corruption. Little by little their all-too-human flaws deepened into obsessions. Fully half of the Primarchs eventually failed the test and were seduced by the ruinous powers, the corruption occurring in ways so subtle that they never even suspected that their own loyalties were changing until it was too late. Horus, the greatest Primarch of them all, was utterly convinced of the virtue of the martial ideals for which he fought. He enjoyed the Emperor's greatest trust and the admiration of the other Primarchs, gaining the coveted title of War Master in the wake of the Ulanor Crusade. He had stood at the Emperor's side from the earliest days of the Great Crusade and through the many long years that followed. Legends say that they fought back to back at the Siege of Realis and the Emperor saved Horus' life. At the Battle of Goro, Horus is said to have repaid the debt by hacking the arm from a frenzied orc that was intent on choking out the Emperor's life. As the Crusade advanced the Emperor eventually returned to Terra to administer his rapidly growing domain. 
he entrusted Horus with leading the crusade along the eastern fringes, little realizing that by doing so he was planting the seeds of his own betrayal. As the Great Crusade pushed outward in the final decades of the 30th millennium Horus had begun to perceive the Empress' actions as craven and dishonorable. All too often compromises were made that he felt were weak and unworthy of the master of mankind while wanton destruction was unleashed on other worlds on the slimmest pretext. The Emperor abandoning the Crusade forces in favor of returning to the administrative center of the now vast Imperium confirmed Horus' worst fears. The coming Age of Enlightenment and Understanding preached by the Emperor as the Imperial Truth was nothing but a mask for his own pusillanimous greed. Surely the warriors that had fought so hard to conquer deserved some say in how the conquests were ruled. What kind of man seeks to become the sole ruler of the galaxy? So, perhaps, the worms of doubt began to squirm in the brilliant mind of Horus. Perhaps he even foresaw a time when the Emperor would have to be rid of him, a mighty warrior with no worthy opponents left to fight. Following the events on the world of Davin when he was healed of a mortal wound incurred against the forces of chaos by chaos cultists in service to the Temple of the Serpent Lodge, Horus began to quietly lay plans for rebellion. He subtly sounded out some of the other Primarchs and began the slow process of gathering his far-flung forces. Horus Space Marine Legions were gradually seduced by the sense of pride and loyalty to the Primarchs into serving the War Master above the Emperor. Initially, the Space Marines had little idea that they were being led astray. The taint spread slowly and subtly, and only later when they reached the point of outright rebellion did their veneer of reason fall away to reveal that chaos had invaded their hearts. In the midst of Horus' preparations, the Imperial commander of Istvan III declared the whole of the Istvan system an independent principality. The Emperor, ignorant of Horus' plans, ordered him to move to pacify the rebellious system. The War Master was unwilling to be drawn into a planetary campaign just as his schemes were coming to fruition and chose instead to virus bomb Istvan III from orbit in what became known as the Istvan III atrocity. Twelve billion souls died in a matter of minutes, their rapidly rotting carcasses consumed by a firestorm that enveloped the entire planet for days afterwards. During the bombardment a group of loyalist space marines discovered signs of the corruption in Horus' followers. They succeeded in seizing control of the frigate Eisenstein and fled into warp space to warn the Emperor. Horus withdrew to Istvan V to marshal his forces for the confrontation to come. The Emperor hesitated, shocked by the betrayal of his war master and unable to believe that his best friend, son and the general was really marshalling forces against him. However, even as he learned of the betrayal, dissent and rebellion spread throughout the Imperial army. Meanwhile, on Mars those who had denounced the Emperor as a false omniscience saw that the time had come. The Adeptus Mechanicus's own fabricator general, the most powerful Magos of Mars, unleashed ancient, forbidden weapons on the surface of the Red Planet as tech priests and the heretics of the newborn Dark Mechanicus fought for dominance in what became known as the Schism of Mars. The fragile Imperium tore itself apart as recently conquered star systems declared independence, and newly appointed planetary leaders seized their chance to declare for the War Master. Confusion reigned and at first many failed to recognize the resurgence of the ruinous powers, seeing the great conflict as a purely political one between Horus and the Emperor. The rot of chaos spread quickly, passing from the War Master's forces to their allies and even their enemies with shocking speed. Loyalists and traitors clashed on hundreds of worlds across the galaxy. After an almost fatal delay, the Emperor ordered seven full Space Marine Legions to destroy Horus and his rebel forces at Istvan V. He had recognized finally that the rebellion could only be brought to an end by eliminating its figurehead and inspiration, the War Master Horus. 
More precious months were lost organizing and mobilizing the forces to reach the other side of the galaxy. Horus was not idle in the intervening time and consolidated his hold on hundreds of systems by declaring himself their new emperor. Wherever Horus banners were raised the corrupting influence of chaos followed. The emperor's retributive strike, now known as the drop site massacre of Istvan V, proved to be a disaster. Of the seven Astartes legions dispatched to destroy Horus, four of them turned against the Emperor and helped massacre the other loyalists instead. The War Master now controlled nine Space Marine legions and had all but eliminated three of the loyalist legions. Thus, the Horus heresy began in earnest. The fighting continued for seven Terran years, and shook the nascent Imperium to its foundations. The Space Marine Legions, the Imperial Army, the Adeptus Mechanicus, the entirety of mankind's dominion turned against itself, and ripped itself asunder. The Loyalists eventually began to prevail over the traitor forces, but Horus knew there was still time to make a decisive strike and win the war. Horus struck directly for his enemy's heart and attacked Terra with the full force of his Space Marine traitor legions. The Emperor was caught unawares by the War Master's audacious move and was cut off and besieged inside the Imperial Palace with a bare handful of Loyalists to defend him. However, the palace defences proved formidable and the subject people of Earth rallied to protect their Emperor, Sahorus was denied the quick victory he had hoped for. Bitter fighting marked every phase of the siege as it dragged out for over a month. Eventually, the mighty war engines of the Legio Mortis breached the towering outer walls and the hordes of chaos poured through into the inner palace. The mighty deeds recorded in the siege of the Imperial Palace would fill a library in their own right, and do so in some parts of the galaxy, but myth and legend have obliterated any hope of knowing the real truth of events. Loyalists hold that at the eleventh hour, the Emperor perceived weakness in the void shields protecting Horus orbiting battleship, the vengeful spirit. According to their holy books, the Emperor, along with his two remaining loyal Primarchs on Terra, Sanguinius and Rogaldorn, teleported aboard the battleship to confront Horus. Other sources strongly imply that the War Master permitted the Emperor to come aboard, perhaps in an effort to bring an end to the bloodshed. A battle was certainly fought, and by all accounts, Horus slew his brother Primarch Sanguinius before himself falling prey to the Emperor. The Emperor was mortally wounded in the battle with Horus, and his physical body all but destroyed. Rogaldorn is said to have retrieved the Emperor's body and returned it to Earth. There it was interred within the Golden Throne where it has remained, unspeaking and unmoving, for 10,000 standard years. Religious followers of the Imperial Creed believe that the spirit of the Emperor still resides within the corpse on the Golden Throne, but many doubtful souls have risked charges of heresy by questioning that supposition. The War Master's body was retrieved by his own legionaries and they fled Terra shortly afterward. Without the key figure of Horus to hold his followers together the rebellion began to fall apart. Recent converts to the War Master's cause switched their loyalties back to the Emperor. A rebel Space Marine legions turned against one another, servants now of fractious ruinous powers rather than any overall strategy. As the Loyalists rallied traitor forces were crushed on world after world and the corrupted Space Marine legions, the traitor legions as they had become known, were eventually pushed out of Imperial space into the Eye of Terror. Across the Imperium, the cult of the God Emperor was born. In the following centuries, it would evolve into the Adeptus Ministorum and the Puritanical cult of the Imperial Creed by the dawn of the 32nd millennium. The Imperium itself evolved into an entity built on the foundations of fear and betrayal led in what became known as the Horus Heresy. A hundred centuries later Horus' actions are painted in the blackest terms and his turning against the Emperor an unthinkable act of villainy.
However, outside Imperial space, some remember Horus differently, as a proud warrior who was unafraid to stand against the machinations of the Emperor and whose vision for humanity extended beyond autocratic rulership of Earth. Chaos also won a victory in the Horus heresy, for the Emperor was crippled by his battle with Horus and had to be interred within the Golden Throne's life support systems, no longer truly alive or dead. This sentenced the Imperium of Man to a long, slow period of decay of the next 10,000 standard years. The 41st Millennium Across the stars, warp storms rage and the galaxy stands on the precipice of a new age as the 41st millennium comes to a close. Prophets and augurs proclaimed the end times for mankind, and the number of instances of demonic possession across the Imperium of Man is rising. Each psychos or accursed is granted an epiphany, in their last grasping death, the victims glimpse the horrific doom that awaits them, an abyss of chaos, absolute in its finality, unending in its despair. Now, across the galaxy, that same vision of ultimate torment, of eternity beneath the lash of demons, has spread. Across untold star systems, countless life forms read the portents and prepare for the dark days ahead. Premonitions of disaster are now rife amongst the Imperium of Man, by far the largest of the galaxy's interstellar empires, but few understand the true nature of the warp and the threat its denizens represent to all life. Yet even distant, technologically backward Imperial planets have marked the telltale signs of the impending apocalypse, the proliferation of mutants, the rise of chaos cults who worship the dark gods and the ever-increasing number of psychos in the human population. The Inquisition sees the warning signs, but there are simply too many Imperial planets in peril for them to halt many of the deadly chain reactions caused by demonic possession. As psychos implode, small tears in the fabric of reality usher in bloody rains of terror across thousands of planets, and in their attempts to suppress the truth and forestall mass panic, the Inquisitors adopt ever more ruthless methods. For every warp rift sealed though, more holes are opened, and the barrier between reality and the realm of chaos is left shattered and gaping in a dozen new locations. Should the weakness of mankind prove too great, one only needs to look at the fall of the Eldar to see the consequences of failure. On the glittering craft worlds, the remnants of the Eldar race do not need the rune casting of their farsias to tell them of the imminent threat. More psychically attuned than humans, each Eldar feels every new wren torn in real space and cringes. Although utterly self-serving and cruel beyond human measure, even the Dark Eldar shudder at the thought of real space engulfed by raw chaos, for if that happened, their hidden city of Camorra within the webway would not stay so for long. Even the horrifying alien Tyranids recognize the threat from the warp, several high fleets have altered their invasion courses in order to avoid warp storms gaping before them. There are scattered records of splinter fleets drifting into warp rifts, most notably after the near destruction of High Fleet Kraken at the fall of Iandan, though the results of such a galactic accident are mercifully hard to catalogue. The Dark Gods care not for their unknowable plans move apace, and their final victory over the defenders of creation seems assured. The End of Days with the opening of the Great Rift at the end of the 41st millennium, the demonic incursions that had plagued the galaxy since time immemorial escalated in both scale and frequency. A new era of terror and bloodshed was ushered in by that galaxy-spanning tear in the fabric of reality, and the armies of the Chaos Gods, mortal and demonic alike, began to conquer and consume the worlds of humanity and the alien races with unprecedented impunity. Had the Chaos Gods worked in unison in the wake of that terrible event, it is doubtless that real space would have been utterly consumed by the sprawling madness of the warp. Yet true to their nature, the Dark Brothers saw the anarchy as an opportunity to fulfill their own agendas, to kill, to change, to pollute, to bathe in excess. So divided, they are unable to fully overcome the fierce resistance of the galaxy's inhabitants. 
The Imperium of Man, the largest single empire in the galaxy, has been galvanized by the return of the legendary Primarch Robert Gilliman, and with him fights a new breed of a warrior in humanity's defense, the Primaris Space Marines. The older races of the galaxy, such as the Aldari and the Necrons, continue to exhibit a stubborn refusal to bow before the Chaos Gods and accept their extinction. While upstart new species like the Tau gain a greater understanding by the day of the realm of chaos and the ancient and malevolent beings within it. The barbaric orcs are only incited by the surging conflicts around them and greet the prospect of a battle against the demonic legions with the same reckless enthusiasm they always have. The intergalactic devourers known as the Tyranids regard the immaterial demons with a special distaste, seeing them only as undigestible threats to the biomass they wish to consume. So the ultimate battle for the galaxy continues, the Chaos Gods and the Demonic Legions threatening to annihilate everything, including each other, in their eternal quest for dominance. Realm of Chaos What is our realm but a cracked mirror? A filthy window that shows a broken reflection of the glory that lies beyond our sight. What tawdry hovels are these? Towers of silver and gold they would be in the Empire's gaze. Or fish. Or flowers. Or a seraglio of silken lovers. Every color, every sense, every action, every reaction, every infraction is reflected and magnified a thousand times. Gods and heroes dwell in that invisible realm in castles of cloud and grandeur, transcendent beings of wisdom and power beyond our comprehension. We who toil through the dross of mortal existence can never know the ultimate blessings of uncertainty, but we can embrace the path of change. The hidden glories of immaterium lie all about us, waiting for us to notice and claim them as our birthright. Demagogues and triers in his epistles to the Gaudians. Insane savants argue that the material universe experienced by mortals represents only the tip of the iceberg and unseen realms exist just beyond perception. They say that the limitless depths of the realm of chaos surround and infuse the tiny chips of physicality that are planets and suns to mortal eyes. They declare that what humanity sees as reality is only a mask, a cloak of normality over the vast and swelling ocean known as the Immaterium, the Warp, or the Realm of Chaos. The raw, unfocused energy of the Realm of Chaos forms a parallel dimension to the material universe, a place of infinite possibilities where raw emotion, belief, and Jungian symbolism hold sway. The realm changes constantly, ebbing and flowing in different locales as it does so. The flows, swirls, and eddies that it creates can form patterns and designs, drawing similar energies into themselves until they achieve a level of consciousness and purpose. When they find the courage to acknowledge the existence of such powers men call them the Chaos Gods. Many nameless gods have been cast up by the warp only to be swept away again by the slow beat of eons, but four great powers of chaos seem eternal, Korn the blood god, Slanesh the prince of pleasures, Nurgle the lord of decay, and Zinch the changer of the ways. In primitive cultures countless creation myths are told of the formless void before the coming of the gods. In some tales the gods are said to have shaped the world from parts of themselves, in others, they slay a great beast and use its bones to lay the foundation of creation, in others the mortal realm is formed from the debris left by the great battles with one another. Seers and magicians of more studious societies make complex arguments for the material universe has given birth to the ruinous powers rather than vice versa. They hold that the ocean of primordial essence that we now see as the seething realm of chaos was calm and undisturbed until it began to be altered by mortal passions and desires. Materially it matters little what came first. The ruinous powers are real, tangible forces in both the realm of chaos and the material universe. They absorb the energies of countless souls in turmoil, waxing ever stronger on the hopes and fears of mortals until they have become truly godlike entities. 
If mortals truly gave birth to the entities that have become the ruinous powers no hint of mortal frailty remains. The gods of chaos represent absolutes completely unsullied by indecision or mercy. Even beyond the realm of chaos there are some that give the fealty to the ruinous powers. Those that proclaim themselves followers of the chaos gods must cleave their own path and soon learn to fear the blessings of the deities. Countless gibbering madmen have declared that they have seen the true face of chaos and received messages from the gods. Physical corruption, mutation and stigmata are apt to sprout from the followers of chaos like unholy fruit. Even so many that lust for power disregard such risks, thinking they can evade the consequences of meddling with powers beyond comprehension. The gods care nothing for the followers or their machinations, granting them unimaginable power or withdrawing it from them just as quickly as the fickle whims decree. Mortals are mere playthings to them, to be used and cast aside at will, at best the objects of momentary fascination. Perhaps they know that once the process of a soul's corruption has begun it becomes inevitable and that the taint of chaos will bring living souls to the gods whether they declare themselves devout or not. It is more likely the ruinous powers are simply unaware of the massive mortality in any conscious sense because the state of existence and motivations are too vast and alien to comprehend. The gods of chaos are such remote and terrifying entities that most mortals who know of their existence hope only to escape the notice. The end of part 1. Thank you for your time. If you enjoyed this audiobook, leave a comment and like. Visit my Facebook, Blogspot or Patreon. Have a nice day. Bye-bye.